Welcome on the Shi'ul lecture number eight, discussing the overview of the second and third book. This Shi'ul is a big challenge because we will discuss not only one mismo or the context of one chapter, we will discuss an entire book, actually two books covering 42 mismorim. And I would like to show from this very general overview, the symmetric structure of book number two and three as one entity crossing the border of the book two to three. And there is a very special message. If we look at it at this resolution, uh, um, on this overview, we will find a very, very clear structure, a symmetric structure, which is powerful and very meaningful. We will discuss the change of the name Elohim in the Mismorim 42 to 83, the so-called el, uh, 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 collection of Elohim. And we will compare a little bit the two David collections in the first and second book and discuss an overview on who was Korach. There are two parts, Korach one and two, and Asaf part one and two. That is by far too much for a lecture. It, wouldn't, it would be even be too much for a whole semester or for a whole set of, of lectures. But it is important to get this overview, and I don't want you to be uh, stressed, be relaxed on that. Over the next lectures, we will elaborate each of these units in more detail. So this overview lecture will give an overall mapping, and afterwards we will go further to more details. Uh, if we look at the text, and that is the introductory note for today, we, we discussed the concept of diachrone and synchrome interpretation. The classical biblical research is interested to learn the history, where did the sources come from, who wrote them, what is secondary, what is primary. The synchrone approach is to look at the way we see it now. Compared to the painting, we don't look at how the painting was created. We look at the final result and what is the message of the final results and the thought. The same is true, and that was, of course, the classical German a researcher, Hermann Gunkel, he was a representative of the diachron approach. I would like to introduce you now to other concepts, which is called Sitz im Leben, also from Hermann Gunkel. Where, did, where were these texts used in classical uh, history of the Bible? Where did they come from? Where were they applied? And now I want to add another concept, which is Sitz in the Literatur. Where do they, how do they fit into the text? Wherever they come from, from the historical background where they were used, how are, now they, how are they presented now in the text we are looking at? And these concepts are, are very helpful to understand in the biblical context where, this, where it comes from and how we see it in a different uh, place now. We had already a very good example for that, that chapter 18 in Tehillim is originally in Shmuel, the second book, is the summary of David's life. It's a song summarizing his entire life when he was an old man. That's the way it's presented in Shmuel. However, in Tehillim, we know the same Mismo as a prayer book, and it has slight differences. Yes, it used to be David's prayer uh, on his life, but in Sefer Tehillim, it is in another context of the literature of the biblical text, and therefore it has new messages. We elaborated that at length in lecture number four, but I think it's important to be aware to understand where the text is used in the context now is not necessarily where it came from, but both aspects are true. We shall see, we shall see in our lecture these different these uh, uh, approaches, and they are very, very helpful for our discussion. So this slide is a very important one. It shows what I understood at the beginning when I looked at Tehillim, the second and third book. It was not clear. It was a long period of time that I tried to research it and find, uh, and find connections and a structure. And the more I looked at it, the better it got. The structure, the structure of book two and three is extremely, extremely clear today to me and has a very, very interesting message and uh, structure, which comes out very, very clearly. We have in the middle, the collection, the second collection of King David, 
of David from 51 to 72. It is surrounded by the first part of Asaf, only one chapter. And we will discuss in the later shul why this chapter is alone. Only one chapter of Asaf in the second book, followed by 11 chapters in the, sec uh, in the third book. And we have eight Mizmorim dedicated uh, from Korach, and here another four. This structure gives the impression that King David's collection of uh, uh, 51 to 72, the end of book two, is the end of David's life. It says at the end of 72, Kolut Philot David Benishai. That is the end of all prayers from King David. So if that's the end, he was surrounded by uh, the Levim in the Mikdash, in the temple, on his left and on, on his right, both Asaf and both Korach. Some of them were part of his life in the second book, and some of them continue to, to sing his songs and are inspired by his writings and his uh, music, even after his death in book number three. So this symmetric structure makes, gives a lot of clarity. Furthermore, we will find that Asaf, they're very close to David. They were singing with him together like priests uh, uh, in the Mikdash, and they were like prophets. However, Bnei Korach, they were the gatekeepers. So if we come into the Mikdash, we pass the gates of the, of the temple, get closer to David, first to Asaf, and walk out after David, together with Asaf, meeting Asaf, and walk out from there, leaving the Mikdash again together with Korach. So this structure is very, very meaningful. And, you, you, and we will see that we have 12 chapters dedicated, uh, written by Asaf, and another 12 by Bnei Korach. All the priests, all the, all the uh, singers in the Mikdash, the Levim, they always appear at least in a group of 11 people. So 11 people, Zitz im Leben, are actually reflected very, very nicely and clearly in the 12 chapters of Asaf and in the 12 chapters of Bnei Korach, Zitz in the literature. This transition or identity is fascinating and has a very, very clear message, as we shall see later. If the first book dedicated to David's teaching and his growth, his religious growth, psychological growth, how to cope with uh, evildoers, how to cope with uh, being close to Hashem. So the second book has a totally different message. How does David function as a king? How is he supported by his singers on his way to the temple in Yerushalayim? If that's the first part, the second part, the third book will show how this continues after his life. And the big change, uh, change in, the, in the entire book is between chapter, between chapter 89 and 90, between the end of the third book and the beginning of the fourth book. So we will talk about this uh, place later when we get there later on. That's, if so, the summary of this structure. David in the middle, left and right are up, and further outside, Korach on the left and the right. How do we approach this analysis? First of all, we have to learn all these Mizmorim, 42 Mizmorim. It's quite a challenge to understand all of them, but that's the way to go. We have to learn each Mizmor and his message afterwards to see how they are connected. That's another approach, another level of work. We can look at the headings, and there are a lot of biographic, biographical notes, marks on some of the Mizmorim in the second collection. When we look at one Mizmor to the other, we have a microstructure. And if we look at the entire book, what you see now in the slide, we have a macro structure, which is extremely, extremely helpful. We should look at the text of each Mizmor as a text in its context and how is it connected to other places in the Bible outside of Sefer Tehilim, the intertext. And if that is not enough, we have a very interesting phenomenon in Sefer Tehilim, which is called the collection of Elohim, which covers just part of these uh, Mizmorim. 
it covers the beginning at the entire second book, and it covers the beginning of the third book up to chapter 83. From 83, much more often, from, 40, from 84, the name of Hashem appears then over this collection between 42 and 83. These are all purely descriptive statements, observations. We have to first describe what we see, what we find, and later on to see how to explain it all together. And here we have an interesting calculation. We have 22 mismorim in, uh, in the second collection dedicated to David. We have 12, as I told you before, dedicated to Asaf. And we have another 12 dedicated to Korah. So taking together, we have 24 of the Levine, the singers in the temple. We have 22 of David here in the middle, but we have two more dedicated to David or talking about David, which is chapter 86, which is has a, a, a prayer for King David in the middle of Korach. And the last Mizmor has no name of David in the heading. However, the entire Mizmor talks about the kingdom of David and the destruction of the dynasty of King David. So taken together, we have 24 and 24. What an interesting number. We'll talk about that later. That is for now the summary just describing what we have. In the first book, we have basically all the entire book is dedicated to King David. The second book, we have Korach one, Asaf one, only one Mismo, eight and one, and King David 22. In the third book, we have the second part of Asaf 11, making it 12 together, and the second part of Korach, making it uh, making it uh, four, and that together is here 24 and 24 for King David. That's an interesting observation. We shall see later on how meaningful that is, this uh, structural observation. So let's keep the number 24 in mind. Here's the overview, and I, I thank Meira Labinsky and Shulamit Meir for this wonderful English and Hebrew a graphic presentation of the entire book. It has the entire book summarized here, the, the first part, book one, two, and three, and the, the, the second part, book four and five, which is the second temple period. I will not elaborate all the details. You have here also the five logos included in this graphic summary. Again, King David, the second collection is here, and he is surrounded by green, the collection of the 12 Mismorim of Korach and the 12 Mismorim of Asaf. I would like to show now the finding, a purely mathematical observation at the glance, but we will see when we look at it closer that it is a very, very meaningful tool how to define and distinguish different parts of Sefer Tehili. It's from the mid 19th century that uh, very, very intelligent German researchers found, without a computer these days, of course, that the name of Hashem is mentioned much more often in the first book than, in the, than, than the name of Elohim. And they found that in the second and third book, till chapter 83, the name of Elohim is used much more often here in green than the name of Hashem. And afterwards, it's again the name of Hashem. So if I did that, of course, I checked it again, counted all the words, put it in an Excel, and here is the graphic presentation. In order to highlight the difference is even clearer, I, we can not only look at the number of uh, times how much Hashem is mentioned, if we put it in a ratio, it gets very, very clear. The dominant name is Hashem and Elohim here, and it's very here, very, very flat, very there, below one, and afterwards it's again Hashem. So this graphic presentation is an observation which is interesting. Is it meaningful? Let's talk now about the meaning. What is the message? 
And here we have an interesting trans, uh, translation of very, very hardworking researchers who found something. Yes, they had conclusions, there are different sources, whatever they found as a, as a solution is not necessarily what I have to accept because it's their interpretation. However, the finding is not something we can argue with the facts. So what is the meaning of this collection called Elokim, Elochistic, Elochistic collection? And the meaning is actually extremely simple. If we remember what Rashi says in his first pasuk on the Torah, why did Hashem create the world with the name of Elokim? Elokim, in the second chapter, it says, And Rashi in the 12th century, the Midrash, much older, gives a clear answer. Hashem planned at the beginning to create the world under, under, the, under the name of strict justice. Elohim is also a name for a judge. But he had to realize that the world could not uh, survive and therefore he gave an additional name of Hashem. He, uh, if we go only according to uh, 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 if we go only according to the structure, to the law, strictly, it will not, the world will not survive. We need Midat Rachamim Hashem. Therefore, in the second chapter, the Yom Asot. Hashem Elohim Eretz V'Shamayim. If we take this rule from the first Rashi al Torah and apply it here to Sefer Tehillim, the answer is most beautiful. In the first book, the name of Hashem, the writer, the psalmist, tries to get connected to the Torah, to Hashem, to overcome evildoers on the world, to get close to David HaMelech, to the kingdom of Am Yisrael, closer to Hashem, and he works on himself, Chapter uh, first book, that is the development of the first book. It's a close personal relationship with Hashem, with His Midat Harachamim, His mercy. The second and part of the third book, they talk about the structure, David's kingdom, surrounded by Levim. We need kingdom. We need a structure. There is a, a structure to Yerushalayim, to Am Yisrael. Chapter 67, to the entire world and many others, we need organization, order. So if Rashi says at the beginning, Hashem created the world with Elohim, and afterwards he added for a personal relationship, Hashem, when he created in chapter 2, men, Adam the Chava, the same is true in the opposite order in Sefer Tehillim. It starts with the Torah, with the whole religious, spiritual development of the writer, along the first book, but that is totally different in the second book. In the second book, we need organization, we need a king, and the king has justice, and, and the, the king has organizations, and is trying to make an impact on the entire world, so everything has to be well, well organized. That's the meaning of this finding. Interesting that all this hard work by a lot of German researchers was taken in a totally different direction, which I don't share at all their conclusion. And actually we have very simple answers if we just look at them, as I believe in the correct way, how to look at the book as it is. So let's now take a look at two places to analyze, to investigate the meaning of this collection. One place is just the transition from chapter 83 to chapter 84, the end of the collection Elohim. What happened there? And I will show you another example to show that. And that's actually a very, very meaningful insight. If we don't understand the finding of the collection of Elohim, we miss a very important insight for our understanding of Sefer Tehili. Chapter 83 is one of the hardest mizmorim to describe how the enemies of Am Yisrael came and tried to destroy uh, Am Yisrael. A uh, description which reminds us very much the final solution. It says in Mizmor Pei Gimel, Asher Amru, Amru lechuven nakhibem yigoy, velo yizacher shem Yisrael ot. They said that we will destroy Am Yisrael, the nation, and the name of, of, of Yisrael will never ever be mentioned again. And there were many nations who came. 
And we have a long list of 11 nations, Edom, Ishmael, Moab, Hagrim, Gval, Amon, Amalek, Pleshe, Tzor, Ashur, all of them came to destroy Am Yisrael. And at the end it says, Hashem punished them. Punish all these enemies. Punish all those who caused so much suffering to Am Yisrael. But at the very end it says, everything is mentioned here, B'Shem Elohim, justice. But at the end we have other names. Visa Vivakshu Shimcha Hashem. Sorry, before we come to the end, that's actually the notion of all the Mizmorim of Asaf from 73 to 83. In all these Mizmorim, only one exception, the, the Mizmor in the middle, 80, 80, uh, 78, all the Mizmorim have at the very beginning, in the first or the second verse, they have the name as a beginning. Elohim, Lama Elohim, uh, at the classical uh, Asaf uh, philosophy, God as a judge, as a judge against us, as a judge with other nations, organization and structure, structure and leadership of the world. That's the world of Asaf, as reflected also in chapter 83. Now let's come back to the end of chapter 83, to the end of the entire collection Elohim. And here we find Vivakshu Shimcha Hashem. All the nations should be punished. All the nations should deserve the punishment uh, for what they did to Am Yisrael. But at the end, the, at the end of this Mizmo and at the end of the entire collection of, the, of Asaf, twice at the end, it's mentioned Hashem. And not just Hashem, Shimcha Hashem. There is a theology. <laughs> And the philosophy of the name Hashem. Not only mentioning Hashem, the name Hashem. Why? Because it reflects mercy. Fill their faces with shame until they seek your name, Hashem. And in chapter 17 and 19, let them know that you, your, no, your name alone is the Lord Hashem, most highly over all the earth. Even the nations who tried to kill Am Yisrael, the worst enemies who said, Lo Yizacher Shem Yisrael Ot, final solution, never ever Am Yisrael will, will be mentioned again. At the end, when they are punished, and they deserve the punishment, Hashem Elohim, at the end, they will search Hashem. That's what we say also in Aleinu, Lafnot Elecha Kol Rishay Aretz, all bad people from the world, all the evildoers, at the end, they will seek Hashem again. What an unbelievable philosophy of Asaf. After surviving all these hard times in the exile and punishment, we hope and wish that all nations, the worst nations, all our enemies, at the end, all of them will recognize Hashem. If that's not clear enough from the Mizmor and the change of the name, we have an outstanding example how these, this concept is proven by another insight. We will learn more about Mizmor 87, one of the Mizmorim of Korach in the, next, uh, in the next lecture. But I want to point out now a very, very interesting connection in this context that two nations, Fleshe and Tso, big enemies of Am Yisrael at the destruction of the temple, are mentioned only twice together in the Bible. End of Asaf, and then the second part of Korach. It says there that, the, that Jerusalem will be a famous city for Am Yisrael and for all the nations of the world. And who is coming to visit there? Who is coming for a pilgrimage to Yerushalayim? I will mention these two nations. Rahav is Egypt and Babel is Babylon. The first uh, exile in Babel and the second one in Babylon. And they will come. And he may flesh it with Saul. Even, uh, even the Philistia and Tyre will come. And what will they be? They will be citizens of Yerushalayim to worship and sing for Hashem. What an unbelievable universal vision. All the nations who yesterday killed Am Yisrael, flesh it in Yoshevet Saul. They will come in the future, according to Korach, and sing Hashem. Midat Hadin of the name of Hashem of justice 
punishment 83 is transformed to the Midat HaRachamim in 87, when even those terrible enemies will come and worship Hashem in Yerushalayim. So we see from the names and from the context of these words, wonderful insights. And here we have another example to compare the collection of Elohim with the collection of Hashem. And that's a classical example how Parshanut Sharif, the contextual interpretation of the Bible, has so much to contribute. These two chapters are doubled, are almost totally identical. At the beginning, not at the very beginning of the first book, and at the beginning, quite at the beginning of the second collection of David in the second book. However, there are very, very tiny differences between them. So classical explanations, of course, said the Midrash, one is now and one is in the time of Mashiach, uh, or another time in the future. That is the Jewish Midrashic uh, approach. And a lot of the research approach says these are, it's the same text by mistake, doubled, or the people were deaf when, they, when it was uh, presented the first time, or they were, uh, they forgot it or they couldn't write it down, they made mistakes. So they, they do not approach the fact that we have a double trans, uh, uh, tradition of these texts in a very respectful or meaningful way. And now looking at the Parshanut Sharif, to compare that, we have here not only a big problem, which we can resolve, we have actually an outstanding uh, key to understand it. Again, the same is more, which we are not going to elaborate now, complains here that there is nobody who does good things. Hashem complains. Hashem sits Bashamayim and he says, nobody calls me. Would there be somebody at Sadiq? Uh, uh, he would be a protection for his entire, for his entire generation if a Sadiq would be there. Why? Because in the first book, we talk about the personal relationship, the religious deep psychological connection of the Meshorel, of the, of the writer to Hashem. And it's about his protection, his survival, his, his well being, his personal religious growth, Ki Hashem Machasevi. However, the second book in chapter 53 has a totally different agenda. Yes, the world is bad, but Hashem looks from Mihashamayim, not Hashem Mishamayim Ishki, Elohim Mishamayim Ishki. And he all the names of Hashem are replaced here by Elohim. Why? And here we find another, about uh, between these almost two identical Mizmorim, we find a very important uh, change in verse number five and six. It's not about the tzaddik, how the generation of the tzaddik will survive. It's about the punishment of the enemies. Sham pachadu pachat, lohaya pachat. Because Hashem, he will punish the bones of those who encamped against you. It's not about protecting the tzaddik. Book one, Hashem. It's about punishment and doing justice to the enemy, to the, all the enemies of Amsrael who caused this violation of the order of the world. Hashem, uh, God doesn't appear with the name of Hashem. He appears for doing justice with the name of Elohim. And the phrase is differently, is, is slightly changed here. It's not about the protection of the tzaddik, it's about the punishment of the enemies. So this shows very, very clearly two different aspects, two different ways to look at it, of the same is more in the two different books. And why is that repeated? It comes to teach us what, whatever King David learned in the first part of the Sefer, that he is very close to Hashem in the way he knows him as a protection for him, Hashem, when it comes now for King David to get the world organized, to be the king, and to present the justice of Hashem and of himself, he needs clear guidelines. And therefore, repeat the same is more. It's very important to repeat it, not by mistake. So we have a, a double mismo, doppelgänger, not because it's a mistake or it's a useless repetition, without special meaning. It is an extremely meaningful repetition because whatever he learned when he was back in school, close to Hashem, in the first book, he, he 
presents it now on an international level, a political level, to do justice for Am Yisrael and justice with other nations. It has to be the same as well to make the same message, but now in a different, uh, in a different uh, context. So that is, I think, the beautiful explanation to explain these differences between the first book, as we show here, of the collection, David's collection, the first one and the second one. And we have actually here with this repetition, an outstanding example, if in the first part, the first book, King David was a philosopher, a religious experience close to Hashem, the Midat HaRachamim, with mercy to Hashem. In the second part, it's exactly the same Mizmor, but now he is a king. He is a real philosopher king in these two contexts. How interesting that Rambam, in a much later time, a uh, genius mind presented this idea without any connection to Sefer Tehilim. V'im yamod melech mi beit David hoge ba Torah v'osek be mitzvot ke David aviv, k'fi Torah sheba'al peh v'torah sheba'al peh v'sheba'al peh. If in the future time, a son of King David, Messiah, Mashiach will come, who studies the Torah and fulfills the Torah, that corresponds to book number one. ויחוף כל ישראל ללך בה ולחזק בתקה וילחם מלחמות השם. And he is also doing justice and building the Mikdash and, and making justice with all the nations. That is the sign of Mashiach. These two components together are actually critical. We need A and B. We need the first part and the second part. I want to look now a closer look to the, to the difference between D1 and D2, the first collection in the first book and the second collection of King David in the second book. As we said, there is a difference between Hashem and Elohim, as we just explained. And there are two Mizmorim, which are mentioned twice, 14 and 53, quite at the beginning, this part, as we just explained, and chapter 40 and chapter 70, at the very ending of the first and of the second collection, which are almost identical at the, uh, at the end of two, these two books. It seems that the way David appears as a, as a king is based on the way he was trained as a philosopher. We saw, we discussed the structure of the first book in the first uh, lectures, and now we deal with the second part. What is a classical feature of the second collection of King David. A classical feature is, it's his life, the public appearance of King David as a leader, as a king, as uh, a leader who, who built Yerushalayim and who was planning to build the temple, but he was not allowed to do so. The very beginning describes, that we will see in lecture 10, describes in chapter 51 his terrible sin with Bathsheba. He was punished for that, and he has to, he had, and he made tshuva. He changed his way, as his 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 life, as we will elaborate in lecture number ten. Bevoi lav natan hanavi kasherba el batsheva. When King De when the God when Natan came to him and uh, rebuke of Natan, it begins there. The, the Mizmor, the second collection, begins with Al Tashikreini Milchanecha, the Ruach Kotshecha Al Tikachmi. David prays, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. The second book, the second collection of, of uh, King David, closes with a note in chapter 71 Al Tashikreini Le'et Zikna. Do not cast me away at the time of old age and do not forsake me when my strength fails. Here we have an old king, an old man. What is the old man doing when he feels that his life is coming to an end? In 71, in 72, he appoints his son to be his follower, to continue his kingdom, his dynasty. 72 starts. God, that's a psalm for Shlomo, bring your kingdom to the son 
of the king to the prince, he should continue. And that's where his lifetime officially ends, Kalut Pilot David Ben Shai, at the end of 72, at the end of the second book. The word Al Tashlicheni, do not cast me away, appears in the entire Bible only twice at the beginning of the second collection of David and at the end. It would have been the end of his career for his sin, and it will be the end of his career for biological reasons when he is an old man. So here we see the story of the second collection of King David, which we will elaborate in more detail in, more detail in another lecture. It ends with Shlomo. Kolut Philot David Ben Ishai, that is the end. He is surrounded by the singers in the temple. That's the way he liked to be. That was his dream. Built a temple. He couldn't build it, so he prepared the construction of the temple. And he appointed the singers because he himself was a poet. He wrote, he liked, he loved music. So he prepared the people who will sing in the temple 12 on his left and on his right, as we see here. And that's what I want to show here. How did David HaMelech vision himself, at least according to Divrei Hayonim, to the book of the Chronicles, the way he present, is presented there? And it says there very clearly, And they came and he was surrounded with the typical cloth, uh, uh, cloth of a Levine, and he was surrounded by the singers. And he was the Al David, a fort bat. He had this a fort of linen, a typical uh, the way Harona Cohen was dressed, as Rashi points out. And he wanted to be together with the singers, Meshorim. Why? Because he was also a Meshorim. He was also a singer. Not a Levine, he's not a Levi, but he is a singer like the uh, like Asaf and Korach. You know, they are not mentioned here with their names, we should see it in a moment, but he's surrounded and he was dancing when he brought uh, the Ark of the Covenant to Yerushalayim. Here we have more details to describe this aspect. And that is actually a fascinating example, how we find something, Zitz im Leben, where did it happen, what we see, and where it did, and how is it presented afterwards in the book? So let's go by that step by step. King David in Chronicles 1 25 appointed uh, the singers. One of them were Asaf. Here we see King David, and he had his uh, music, which he prepared for the Mikdash, and he had the Bnei Asaf, who were close to him prophets, singers, a tradition of, so of songs, and they were very close to him. And there are 24 groups, Mamadot, 24 groups of Levim, and each of them has exactly 12 people. Look here, it says 24 times. Twenty-four times. And when the list of the song of the uh, singers is finished, we have a beautiful list here, interesting names. Pay attention here. One of them, two of them are called Gidalti Veromamti, a Pasuk in Yeshayao, Banim Gidalti Veromamti. So a very meaningful list of 24 groups of Levim who worked all the time, one of them in the Migdash together with King David. But at the end, at the gates, we had from the Korach group, there were gatekeepers. So what do we have here? King David at his lifetime appointed everything to build the Mikdash, to appoint Levim, and to have a clear service, shifts of Levim within and without the Mikdash, and always 12. These 24 Ma'amadot are a very, very interesting testimony, a very interesting example of 24 groups of Levine, which were very close to the heart of King David. And here we have something interesting. 
that La'arba'a ve'esrim, the 24 groups, the name of King David in Sefer Divrei Hayamim in the Chronicles is spelled as a rule mostly with a yud. David, his name was bigger by a yud, not Dalet Vav Dalet. It is the David Dalet Vav Yud Dalet. If you count the name of the, of, of the name, if you count the letters, the numerical value, the matria, it comes up to 24. This change sounds like a drush, a cute explanation, but what does it have to do with reading the Bible according to the Pshutoshan Mikha? And I think we shouldn't be too critical here because we have actually a very nice example from our week's parasha, where the name of Ephron is mentioned as the owner of Maratha Machpela, but when and he's, his name is mentioned is spelled only Ein Pei Reish Vav Nun, and when he sells the money and Abraham pays him Arbama or Shekel, just when he comes and puts all the coins in front of Ephron, only one time. The name Ephron is mentioned without the Vav. And if you check the numerical value of Ephron, it's not a mistake that somebody forgot to write the Vav. The numerical value of Ephron is exactly 400. To tell us, as the Midrash points out, if somebody is money-minded, even if he gets all the money, his name shrinks. And his name Ephron, which means afar, dust, he knows only money and business and what he's going to sell him, his name shrinks. So uh, taking the numerical value of the name, and particularly if there's a change in the spelling, is not that far-fetched. And I think it's true for Ephron, and it's very true for King David, who was dreaming about that. So if we take together who was King David in the first temple period, King David, as Yeshayahu, and as in the Psalms, we have a shift of the meaning of the image and of the writing of Yeshayahu in the first temple period, in his first part of Yeshayahu, and in the second temple period. In the second temple period, it was a revival of the values of the messages of the first temple period. If that is true for Yeshayahu, and we spoke about that, in the Psalms, where in the first part, King David is described as the hero of the first temple period, but we think about him from the perspective for the retrospect approach of the second temple period. In the second temple period, the memory of King David keeps us alive, and he is alive, King David, David Melech Israel Chai Kayam, to lead the revival in the second temple period based on what we have in the first temple period. The same is true for the book of Kings, Sefer Melachim, which ends with the, with the exile to Babylon. It is the pre-exile historiography, writing of history, compared to the Chronicles, where the book of the Chronicles ends with the declaration of Cyrus that they are allowed, the Jewish people is allowed to come back to Eretz Israel. And here we have exactly the descriptions of King David, how he prepared everything only in the Chronicles because that is where they want to prepare the rebuilding, the reconstruction of the Mikdash. So we have a very interesting comparison as we described already the difference between Yeshayahu, the word of God, compared to the Psalms, the word and the feeling of human um, existence. So if that is true for Yeshayahu compared to the Psalms, the same is true the, the way we write history in, in the time of kings, the first temple period rewritten in the Chronicles. So a lot of the Chronicles reflects very much the second temple period because at that time, the Chronicles were written, was written to describe the first temple period. We know about King David that his career did not come to an end with his death. And we know from Yeshayahu, Yirmiyahu, Yechizkel, Hosea, and Amos that he plays an important role in the future Geula for the future when Am Yisrael will be unified and we will be rebuilt and come back from the exile. So no surprise that the life of King David continues very, very meaningful after his death in the second temple period. And that's what we see on the, on the Psukim here 
from the first prophets, the classical prophets of the first temple period. And please pay attention, it's consistently written with Dalit Vav uh, Dalit, only in Amos, Amos it's different. But in the second temple period at the time of Shivat Zion, with the renewal of King, of, of King David's, of David's kingdom and the restoration of the former glory, Lachzir Atal Yoshna, Zechariah, Ezra, Nechemiah, mentioned King David always with the youth, and in Ezra and Nechemiah, he is mentioned that he does Lehalel et Hashem, Lehashem Tito, Ki Leolam Chazdo, classical phrases of Sefer Tehilim. That's actually the place where King David from the first temple period came to full color as a singer when Am Yisrael came back, Veshuv Hashem, Shivat Zion, Ha'inu Kecholmim, and the spirit, the legacy, not of the historical King David of the first temple period, but rather of the nevuah, of the prophetic King David, of the vision of the future King David for, for Am Yisrael, for all generations, Levavit Ulezaro Adolam, came to full to his full role. So here we have a very interesting connection between the first temple period, King David, the historical one, and his revival in the second part. That is reflected not only in Sefer Divrei uh, Hayamim, in Chronicles, but Sefer Tehilim, the second part, as we shall see when we get to the fifth book. The fifth book emphasizes very, very often the Hallel, and Hoda'a, exactly the way it's described in Sefer Ezra, Lehalel ulehodot lehashem tito, ki leolam chazdo. That is described in the second part of the book, as we see here, uh, with all the Hallel and Hoda'a, in the all the units of Mizmorei uh, Hallel ve Hoda'a. That is King David. His mind inspires Am Yisrael, not only from his lifetime in Sefer Shmuel, first and second book of Tehilim, but for the generations to come in the last part of Sefer Tehilim. Now we should summarize what we learned about Zitz im Leben. Where did King David act? Where did he leave his fingerprints? And how is that reflected in the text? So very simple. He came to Yerushalayim and he was in the middle he was leading the, uh, the ceremony to bring the Aron Habri to Yerushalayim, and he wanted to be surrounded by the Levim when he brought it and when he worked and was established, in his, uh, established the temple in Yerushalayim. That's exactly what we see here. That we have in Sefer Tehilim, this structure, David is surrounded by the uh, we have chapter 50 only, just before. That's the entire Osef Rishon, the first collection of Asaf, just before the second collection of King David. And afterwards, we have an outstanding collection, which we will discuss later on as we get there, of 11 Mizmorim, while chapter 78 is the longest Mizmor of this collection, is exactly the middle of this collection, is actually also the middle of the entire book of Tehili. Chapter 78 is a fascinating one, surrounded by 77 and 79, which is a symmetric uh, framework to 78. These Mizmorim talk about what was close to the heart of, the, of King, King David, the justice in the Migdash and the impact he has on Am Yisrael and on the future, even, uh, even after the exile. And that is further, uh, therefore, it is part of the collection of Elohim. The second part of Korach have a very, very fascinating structure. The first part, 42 to 49, is parallel to the second part, 44, uh, 84 to 89, as we see here, and it will be elaborated in the next lecture when we talk about Bnei Korach. There is a clear correspondence. How did Bnei Korach sing when they were together with King David, second book? How do they sing when they continue to sing without King David? Oh, they put King David somewhere in between them 
but we will see the same words appearing in the first part, appear in the second part in full correspondence. That's a beautiful masterpiece and structure of these, these Molin. So we learned that the Sitz im Leben, when did David act as the king who appointed Jerusalem as the city of Am Israel, as the place for the king, as the place for the temple, when he brought the Aaron there, when he was surrounded by the Mishorim, that's exactly the way the second and third book are constructed. King David in the middle, 24 Mizmorim. The, the Mishorim surround him, 12 Asaf and 12 Bnei Korach. We will learn in the two lectures on Bnei Korach and Asaf how did these messages and the content of these Mizmorim serve very much to prepare David, uh, to prepare the kingdom of King David in the second book and afterwards to give afterthoughts in the third book after his death, how to continue his legacy for future generations to come. It is a very clear structure. Now it needs a lot of reading, a lot of analysis of these Mizmorim in order to better understand what I presented to you in very general terms. As I told you, if somebody reads the book, he crosses this entire unit of the second and third book in Sefer Tehilim, but he actually experiences that he crosses the entrance to the temple where, where uh, Bnei Korach sit, the gatekeepers. He gets closer there to Asaf, who were very close to King David, and after King David, after King David's death, at the end of the second book, he continues, they continue to sing, even if they leave the Mikdash, not only geographically, but also historically to the exile, and they continue the legacy of Asaf and Bnei Korach when it comes to the, to the third book, to the second temple period. That is a, such a meaningful structure. One cannot see it only uh, from a certain distance, from a bird's view. If you read one Mismo and another Mismo, we will never have the perspective to overview it in this context. So we summarize the main structure of Sefer Felim is between book three and four. Beforehand, we have the unit of the second and third book, as I presented, David in the middle surrounded. The collection of King David II corresponds to the collection one in the first book. And there is a lot of meaning, which we should see later on. We should just mention briefly that the doxologies, the endings of book number one, two, three, very, very much reflect the ending of the three books, but in more details, it's the classical ending, Baruch Hashem Elokei Yisrael, Meholam Ve'ad HaOlam. At the end of King David's life, when Shlomo is appointed his son as his follower, we add Baruch Hashem Elokim. Why is the word Elokim here added? Because here, it's the only chapter which appears in the collection of Elokim. So the word Elokim, which appears here, and only here, is very, very much justified here. Oseni Flaot Levado, he is acting with wonders because Shlomo is the, the king after King David, who oh, a lot of expectations for his kingdom. But at the destruction, the story looks totally different. At the time of the destruction of the third book, we will talk about it when we get there. Elokim is deleted. Elokei Israel is deleted. Nobody, there is not a feeling of the presence of Hashem when Mikdash, when the temple, when the state of Israel, when, uh, is, uh, when the Jewish people is punished and destroyed and brought to the exile. Baruch Hashem, no Elohim, no Elokei Israel. Leolam v'ad olam is shortened. Leolam, yes, they continue the tradition of King David, Amen the Amen. But the, it's very short, laconically short, because they cannot say Eloke Israel anymore. As we pointed out when we discussed in the first lecture, the, the differences between the doxologies. So we saw today the structure of book two and three, which was a very, very general overview. Please, as I, uh, I want to emphasize again and again, uh, be relaxed, 
just to get an overview, which we will learn more. In next week's shiur, we should focus on Tehillim 47 and the, connect, the, and the collection, the first part of Korach. We should look afterwards at uh, uh, the unit of 51 to 72 in the shiur to come and look at the different units of Sefer Tehillim in order to get a better understanding of the second book and the third book. Thank you very much for your attention. We summarized, we saw the symmetric structure. We, used, we saw the use of Elohim, the difference between collection one and two of King David. We compared a little bit about Korach and a little bit about Asaf, which we'll discuss in next lectures. Thank you very much for your attention and a lot of uh, pleasure and enjoyment to read Sefer Tehillim.